Well, I'm uh, so thankful you're having a chance today to meet somebody that uh, really has had a profound influence in my life, and uh, his music has spoken to me in just huge, huge ways, and so it's what a thrill to uh, have Wayne here. Now, it started out, and, but, and this is our fourth time through this. <laughs> How you doing, buddy? Good. good. Are, you, are you good? Yeah, really good. It's like schizophrenic church. Coffee it up. Yeah. Coffee'd That's what I tell up. my friends. What's Crossings like? Well, it's kind of like schizophrenic church. It's a little bit of everything. <laughs> Good medication, you'll be fine. <laughs> I like all the different services, though. It's cool. And um, so far, I haven't sensed this. Our service is better than their service. You yeah. Know, some between all the services. Yeah, yeah. Between, even between services within a, the same church. Like, well, they go to that service, and that's kind of like that. <laughs> I think we're doing, it's pretty, these folks are a resilient group of folks. They're They've tolerated me for many, many years, so Let's here speak. we are. Um, one of the early, early songs when I first really uh, got acquainted, I don't know when you started recording, 80s, 80. mid-80s, 1980, okay. And um, I've listened to a lot of the music, the, the songs are unbelievable, and there's a lot of them, and there's CDs out there, by the way. Um, I'd love for you to experience what I get to experience all the time, and uh, in my car, it's always seeming to be on, but I remember when uh, Tyler was born, the first one, and then it happened again with Chris, and it happened again with Cole. There's this song that, that he had done, and I'd heard it, but it totally changes everything when all of a sudden you're living it, and, uh, and then I quoted it at Tyler's wedding two years ago. And it was a song about somewhere in the world today, a little girl will go out to play. I think it's all dressed up in mama's clothes. But there's this line in that song that says, because somewhere in the course of this life, my little boy will need a godly wife. And when I heard that as a new parent, what it did for me was something I tried to encourage other parents to do, and that is it gave me a sense of vision for my, son, for my son's life and then my daughter and my other son, a sense of vision for their life. I don't know why, why that, that's what snapped the switch for me. Yeah. Suddenly I have a vision that there's somebody out there, there are people out there in this kid's journey that are going to be used by God in a significant way. And uh, it just meant the world to me. So, of course, I don't know, you wrote it for your own kids. Yeah. Well, and uh, it, it just is fascinating to think that at this very moment, for some of these parents that have young children, at this very moment, other people are being prepared to interface with your kids in their lives. Right. right now, at this very moment, what are they? And I, and I remember thinking, what are they doing? I hope they're in a home where mom and dad are loving on them, taking good care of them, keeping them safe. Hope it's a little girl who loves her daddy and who daddy loves his little girl. So I wrote this. Somewhere in the world today, the little girl will go out to play. All dressed up in mama's clothes At least the way that I suppose it goes Somewhere in the world tonight Before she reaches to turn out the light She'll be praying from a tender heart A simple prayer that's a work of art I don't even know her name but I'm praying for her just the same That the Lord will write His holy name Right there on her little heart Oh Cause somewhere in the course of this life A little boy will need a godly wife So hold on to Jesus, baby Wherever you That's good stuff. <laughs> Man. <laughs> but th there was one more uh, that uh, we, we just latched onto as young parents. And I, th I think any of you grandparents, parents, anybody that seems to have a child in your life that you love uh, can relate to this. But they came home with, from Sunday school or school, they'd been writing things. In cra I, I actually saved this stuff. My kids at first thought it was kind of weird, but I have this huge file in each one of our kids. <laughs> And uh, every now and then when they, even at their uh, wise ages that they're at now, they're grown up sort of, but uh, 
uh, they go and pull that file out and say, Dad, why'd you say this? And one, I've got twigs, two little sticks with yarn around them. I don't know why I say it, because you made it. I just want to always have it. <laughs> it's weird. It's, it is weird. It's kind of weird. <laughs> but anyway, you had the same thing happen to you. you had, I mean, on the ref- watercolor ponies on the refrigerator door. Yeah. Simple, isn't it? Yeah. Which, but I didn't think of it. I didn't write the song. <laughs> First lines of songs are often very difficult to come up with, and the deep thinker that I am, I'm sitting in the kitchen one day, I look up on the fridge, and there was this little watercolor painting of a, of a, of a pony. <laughs> so I wrote this on the, at the kitchen counter. There who wa- I wish I'd written it a little lower, but anyway, uh, <laughs> this is 25 years ago. How old is your son? How old is your oldest? Tyler's 24. 24, yeah. There were watercolor ponies on my refrigerator drawer And the shape of something I don't really recognize Brush with careful little fingers and put proudly on display A reminder to us all how time But baby, what will we do When it comes back to just me and you They look a little less like little boys every day And the pleasure of watching little children growing Is mixed with a bitter cup of Cup of knowing that the watercolor ponies are gonna one day. This is sad. <laughs> <laughs> if you're ever having a party and you want somebody to bring the room down, I'm your guy. I, if things are getting a little too happy, 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 I'm your guy. That's an awesome song. You don't bring the room down. It just that there's another. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, that other line about uh, what was that last line? Because it just that's what we just hit. You know, sometimes the ponies will ride away. You know, and now we're empty nesters. And yeah. Kim looks over and goes, "Oh dear Lord, now what am I going to do? <laughs> you know? Now I'm stuck here with you in the house." <laughs> Anyway, great stuff, and I just love what God has done in your life. You've also written a book, though. On, you know, we kind of fast forward now. This was about your kids. You've written a book about your dad. Dad died in 97 at age 70, and after he died, I wrote this song called Turning Into Dad. And, um, and then I wrote a book about some of the stories I had with him because um, I realized that, like it or not, we're all turning into our parents. And looking at you, some of you already have, and uh, <laughs> me too, and uh, I, you know, we're, we're all going to, and you, some of you are with all the might that you have saying, not me, and uh, I have bad news for you, yes you are, and, and that's okay if you embrace the finer points of your parents, if you embrace the finer, higher virtues of your mom, of your dad. And some of you are saying right now, they didn't, they didn't have any. You don't know my mom and dad. I didn't know them. Some people are so bitter about their parents that they can't find anything to be grateful for. If you can find one thing and you're still hard in your heart and you're hurt from what they did to you, I don't know how that feels. But I can tell you from other things that have hurt me, if you can find something to look toward heaven and say, God, thank you that my dad was this way. Thank you that he taught me how to do this. He taught me how to fish or taught me how to wash the car or taught me how to play ball. Or Thank you that my mom took me to practice. Find something to be thankful for. It'll help knock away some of that crust. But I decided I'd try to embrace the finer points of my dad and, and uh, leave the rest behind. That's what I wrote about in the stories. It's a great book. So all that's out there. Uh, I think out here in the foyer with the CDs and the books. Um, you know what you did, what you did I mean, and I hear something different every service, as you can tell, but what you did for your dad, you know, in terms of deciding to, let's say, forget some of the things that didn't go well, but remember what did. Uh, something I wanted to kind of tee up for you to think about today. Um, 
As a church, we've done a lot of things reaching out to other people. Uh, we've got our clinic and community center over at Penn and Hefner. Um, that's getting ramped up. You know, we got a grant from a foundation here in town who was so thrilled with what we do. Uh, they believe we ought to have a better facility, a larger one, and build our own. And uh, most of you are aware, I think we, we were given a $6 million grant from uh, this foundation to help our clinic expand and make sure it's, it's a bright light in the city for years far beyond all of us. So uh, we do some really exciting things that God is really blessing our clinic, community center, our Hispanic campus, our outreach to the schools, our prison ministries, those uh, celebrate recovery, all kinds of cool things. But lately, uh, our staff on a retreat here not long ago, uh, I shared with them kind of what was on my mind, and boy, they just jumped in there with their thoughts. And, and it is basically this. Sometimes I think we're overlooking the person right next door and the cubicle right next to us or across the street or at the school. And uh, I think there's opportunities for us to begin to be sensitive. And, and I came across this Bible story that uh, I've been through many times. I remember my dad telling me uh, when I first became a pastor, I said, Dad, what if I run out of things to say? <laughs> And he, he said, well, Marty, every time you go through the Bible, it's something different. It means something different to you. And boy, was he right. So here's this story in, in uh, Luke 7. And there's this picture of the church. And that's what I want to, that's what we, we were talking about earlier this week. And there's a picture, I think, of what happens to Christians and to the church, if we're not careful. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus goes to his house, sits down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city, another, this is a new living, I think that NIV would say she's a prostitute. Immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there. She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. She knelt down behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet. She wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting the perfume on. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus, knowing his thoughts, said, Simon, I have something to say to you. Verse 44, look at this woman kneeling here. Now, there were some things customary that they did uh, when you had a dinner guest. You, you did three things. One, you provided some kind of water, uh, cool water for the feet. Dusty roads and sandals and those kinds of things, they were dirty feet. And so the, to help them prepare to relax, they would wash the feet. They would typically embrace each other kind of with hands on shoulders and, a, and maybe a peck on the cheek kind of thing, a very greeting of someone who was a valued guest. And then they provided some olive oil to rub through the hair, and they, they would cool them off kind of, you felt a little refreshed and ready to go have dinner. He said, you did none of that for me. Simon the Pharisee did none of that for Jesus. So you can tell what he was thinking about Jesus to start with. I'm not sure who this nutcase is, but let's find out. And then all of a sudden, this sinful woman, you know, who, who, he, who Jesus seems to allow to touch him, confirmed with Simon, yeah, this guy is certainly not a prophet. And Jesus says, from the minute I walked into your house, you did, do, you did none of those things. Yet, she's washed my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. She, she's kissing my feet from the minute I sat down. She has anointed my feet with rare perfume. Now, here's, here's what hit me this time through this thing. I don't think this woman just had some random tears as she approached Jesus. I don't know why this time. I saw her standing behind Jesus sobbing. She'd heard him speak. Clearly, she'd heard something. And for the first time in her life, there was a man who wanted nothing from her. That's what really hit me. He had something for her. He didn't want anything from her. And he is, he tells, he, she had heard him say that she's valuable, she's loved by God, her sins can be forgiven and can all be set free. And so then she has her chance, there he sits around the dinner table and they would recline, as you know, they kind of reclined with maybe up on an elbow and feet out behind them. And she thought she'd come into the room possibly, people would tend to stand around and watch these things anyway. So she thought she could go in and do her thing and not interrupt. And she's sobbing. Can you imagine that? Loving somebody for the first time in her life who didn't want anything from her. And she's sobbing. 
That's how you need, that's why you would need to unravel your hair to wipe tears off of somebody's feet because they're wet because she's sobbing. And I, I've, I wrestle with this so much because Jesus says this statement. He goes, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, <laughs> that was brave, have been forgiven because she's shown much love. But a person who's forgiven little shows little love. A person who's forgiven little shows little love. And I, it hit me this time that it's really about forgetting what God has done for us so we would have some interest in doing that for another. If you remember that you've been forgiven and set free, how could you not love and forgive somebody else? So, you know, we've grown up in church, and there have been times when, uh, what's the quote I found? Um, I've often felt like I'm standing outside looking through the window at a party which I wasn't invited. And there are so many people, I think, in our world who, who feel like they've just simply not been invited or they're not welcome to this party we're having. I think that's true. And you made another point about inside sometimes the people that are inside in the party don't feel like they belong there as well right. don't feel like you're good enough and we i think we both and many of you have seen a time when you would think that the church who's lifting up christ would stick with you in the tough times and instead of sticking with you and walking with you they run they run away and and why you know i've always been so perplexed what where did we get off track so much that the sinful woman we at times would be more like Simon and say, wow, if you knew who she was and you knew what kind of stuff she was into, you'd still you'd kind of steer clear of her. And Jesus says, no, we, we invite her in. I don't know why. We, and you've had that experience. There were times you, you even said, I think one of the services, your songs now, you wrote them. They mean different things yeah, to Yeah, it comes yeah. back around and means something different. What's, what's that about? Well, I think uh, in, in the party, like I said, sometimes you're in the party, but you hope people don't find out about you or they will throw you out of the party. Yeah. And um, I used to have a, one of my band guys a long time ago, after every performance, he'd walk by me and he'd say, fooled him again. <laughs> and I th finally I said, why do you say that? And he was so insecure, he's afraid somebody's going to find out hmm. that he wasn't as good as people thought or something. But um, I don't know why. I, I think one of the reasons we tend to turn on people and pounce when they're down is because the thing that took them down is really close to you. Mm -hmm. And you know that you could be there. That's right. And I have been in that rock throwing position as well. I've, thro I've, I've thrown the rocks too. And uh, it seems like the things that we feel like, oh, I would never do that. We can embrace that. And in a lot of churches, you'd rather have a murderer who has been redeemed and reformed and come to Christ in a revolutionary conversion come and minister in your church than a divorced person. Because you in your heart think, I would never kill somebody. And you probably think, well, I would never whatever but the truth is you know that you're capable of that if you know yourself and you're honest you know I could that could happen to us and so we tend to pounce on the things that are closest within our realm of possibility I think that's just a theory I well and you made another point that I really I thought was just great in one of the early things I think sometimes for us it's hard we feel like if we embrace someone living in a way that we think is just repulsive if we embrace them, that somehow we're condoning or we're approving. And that's really not our business. And that they got away with it. They're getting away they're with getting it. getting away with it. Exactly. We think they're going to get away with it. The pain that they already feel is just about killing them. And nobody's getting away with anything. That, that's what you said. That's key right there. Nobody's going to get away with nobody's anything. Nobody's getting away with anything. Yeah. We, we are our own uh, judge, jury, and... Um, executioner most yeah. of the time. We don't need anybody else to do that. So I, I think what finally helped me get this clear somewhere in this journey in the last 20 years, and, and maybe it happened for me. Uh, I remember when, when I had a very, I wish all my encounters with God were this strong, but I remember when God just said to me, Marty, you are not their judge. You are their friend. Now you be the friend. 
and let me take care of the rest. Because God knows where it's headed. And he knows what's going on here. And I, I just sense, you know, it's time for me to love them like Jesus loved me, forgive them like Jesus has forgiven me, stick with them like Jesus has stuck with me. That's what I'm supposed to do. And if we would do that, I don't think you'd have enough room in any church. I think it'd be a whole new concept. And because the Holy Spirit, that's his job is to convict them. Right. And, uh, and certain, certain places, certain churches, certain parts of the country, certain denominations, the Holy Spirit has been either blown way out of proportion or taken completely out of the equation. And if you take the Holy Spirit out of the equation, then the, who's going to do the convicting? I will. Mm -hmm. Who's going to do the one? That, who's going to be the one to bring judgment on them? Right. I'll do that. Pick me. But that's the Holy Spirit's job. Our job is right. to bring them the truth and let the Holy Spirit of God speak to them in their heart and deal with them. That's not our job. Not our job. I'm asking you all. You know, I, I said I was kind of teeing up a subject today that. Um, I want you to really be thinking about it. And this is going to be a, 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 a theme around crossings, really. Uh, not necessarily a series. I'm not saying we're going to talk about it every Sunday. But it's going to be something we're paying close attention to all the way up through Easter right now. For I don't know why Easter. I mean, it's not like we're going to quit caring at Easter time. But, but I mean, we're, we're really going to, we believe God is calling us to a level of love and forgiveness in this community as individuals that we've not probably addressed in our church before as like we're going like we're going getting ready to address it so i'm just asking you to begin to pray who is it and they probably already come to your mind who's that person you might know who's standing outside looking into this party wondering why they're not invited who might be sitting here wondering if they're allowed to even stay in the party maybe you know somebody in that condition maybe you feel that i'm asking you to begin listening to what maybe God has put on your heart in the last 20 minutes. And there's a person somewhere, again, they may be at work, they may be at home, in the neighborhood, at the school, at the grocery store, at the Starbucks, wherever it is. And somehow you're just wondering, I wonder what their story is. And maybe God's prompting you to find out what their story is. And listen to them. If you would think of who that one person might be, I want you to write their name on your heart and burn it into your mind and pray for that person and pray that God will show you a door in which you can build a bridge to them by which they would know that you're the kind of person that's going to stick with them and you're not worried about their past, that in, in, in Christ we're only dealing with futures. I wonder if you would do that and write that person's name in your, into your thoughts. Who is it you would like to pray for? who might discover how much we're loved and forgiven. There's a song that Wayne's going to sing, and you're the one who told me about it this week, just a great song. And it says, in the middle, it says, The time is now, come church arise. Love with his hands, see with his eyes. So think about that person. Listen to this, listen to this song. Brothers, let us come together, walking in the Spirit. There's much to be done. We will come reaching out from our comforts. And they will know us by our love. Sisters, we were made for kindness. We can light the darkness as he shines through us. We will come healing with a song we sing. They will know us by our love. The time is now. Come church arise. Love with his hands. See with his eyes. Bind it around you, let it never leave you. They will know us by our love. Children, you are hope for joy.
justice Stand firm in the truth now Set your hearts above You will be reaching Long after we've gone They will know you by your love The time is now Come church arise Love with his hands See with his eyes Bind it around you Let it never leave They will know us by our love Bind it around you Let it never leave you They will know us by our Aren't you glad Wayne Watson was in the area and stopped by to see us? <laughs> I hope you'll come back. I'd love to come Maybe back. next time you come back, we'll just do one. Okay. Just do one big, great concert. I was in Tulsa last night at the Maybe Center. I always love yeah. that name, the Maybe Center. <laughs> really? Mm, maybe. Um, <laughs> I was there last night with... Um, who was there? Jackie Velasquez, uh, Petra, Petra, uh, Audio Adrenaline, and uh, Avalon. It was just like an '80s <laughs> blowout. Can I tell one more thing? Yeah. When he's talking about being ready to share with people, I've, I've always been a reluctant witness. When we would go visit, when I was a kid, we'd go on visitation. I would always go to places I knew nobody was home. <laughs> I hate confrontation. I will let somebody just roll me rather than confront them. I, I don't like it. I don't like to confront strangers. But if we're walking in the spirit, God, and this sounds like something you'd hear at church, but look around. Here's where, here we are. Uh, if you walk in the spirit, this is, this is the kind of stuff God can do. I was picking up Payway the other night. Payway, Chinese yeah. takeout. Um, and I played golf that day. And I had changed my shoes. I'd taken my socks off, golf shoes and all that, and put on sandals. And so my ankles had this brown line oh, and then yeah. little white feet at the bottom. And I'm standing there picking up my food, and a guy sitting behind me says, what'd you shoot today? <laughs> this is a complete stranger. What'd you shoot today? And I said, excuse me? And he said, he pointed at my feet. I said, wow. I mean, I, I told him, and, he, and he's, we started talking. And uh, he was swearing like, I mean, I just met the guy. He was swearing like it was a part of his everyday thing. And we walked outside, and uh, he said, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a musician. He said, really, what kind of music? I play Christian music. And he said, I'm sorry. This is the timeline. What, what, do you, what kind of music do you sing? Christian music. I'm so sorry. This is how quickly he said this. I'm so sorry. I've fallen away. Oh. Promise you. I'm so sorry, beat. I've fallen away. And he put his head down. He shook his head. I've fallen away. Oh, my. I don't know this guy. Hmm. But like your church here, I said, why don't you come see us over at my church in Houston? I felt comfortable asking anybody to come. And uh, he came. And now, I don't know what's going to happen with him, but I just shared with him a little bit. And Holy Spirit was just like all over Free. him. and I'll, It's not supposed to be, be that way. In some ways, it's not up to us. Oh, you know what man. I mean? All we got to be is sensitive to the moment. And God will do it. Yeah. God takes care of it. And we just Even if you're shy or reluctant, right. he right. can still make it in a situation where you can make it your own and do it the way he would have you do it. You and it's not about being it. articulate or wise. No. It's about just being open yeah. as a friend. What's that song say? See with his eyes, love, love his with hands. his See. hands. Can we do that? So I'm going to ask you to think of somebody whose name would be on your heart. Let's stand together as we close our time in prayer. 
And I want to remind you that as everybody begins leaving the sanctuary, uh, if you have anything on your mind you would like to spend some time on your knees praying about, feel the freedom to come to these altars. Our prayer team, some of our pastors are here, would be happy to pray with you or to leave you alone. And maybe you feel a need. It has nothing to do with what we've talked about today. Just please feel the freedom to come and kneel before you head to your car if you'd like while everybody's leaving the room. Okay? Let's pray. Father, we do ask you to give us a sensitivity to notice people around us. Father, we claim to have the greatest story in our hearts ever given to mankind. We claim to carry the greatest truth that will ever be told. We claim to have the greatest gift that will ever be given. That is the love of God Himself through Jesus Christ who forgave us, cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Father, may we no longer be protectors of that secret. Allow us, Father, to open our hearts and offer what we've been offered to others who just may simply need to know we care. Father, I pray you would show us, tell us, wrestle with us until we have that name in our heart, on our minds, and on a list. And we will pray until we know what it means for that name to be in front of us. Father, we thank you for this day we've shared together. It's been wonderful. We thank you for how you've blessed us. In Jesus' name, amen.